I have separated all known dinosaur wisdom into three categories. Animal, vegetable, rocks. Well, what about fire? Vegetable. What about water? Water is the opposite of fire, which we have previously established as a vegetable. What's the opposite of a vegetable? Fruit. So, water is a fruit. Fruit is not a vegetable, so it has to be either an animal or a rock. We know it's not an animal, therefore, fruit is a rock. What's up, guys? This is Mr. Mahmood, and you're watching video two of the classification unit. Um, I know that intro video is probably something you guys aren't familiar with. I'm pretty sure I'm dating myself here. That show, The Dinosaurs, I think came out about the time you guys were born. But hopefully it did a good job of showing you how uh, if you just let people group all the living things on Earth however they wanted to, you can get all kinds of different combinations. A lot of them probably wouldn't make much sense. Uh, so we've kind of counted on the taxonomists and those scientists involved in classification over the last few hundred years to do it for us. Now, it started out really simple. Basically, everything was grouped into plants and animals, not quite as as a vegetable, animal, and rock like in the video, but plants and animals were pretty much how everything was broken in. Uh, and then little by little as new discoveries were made and new microorganisms were being found, the, the invention of the microscope really opened everyone's eyes to all kinds of life that they never knew existed before. So little by little, new organisms and new groups of classifications started being developed until you come up with the six kingdoms that we have today. Now, I know I never thought I'd actually be saying this, but Back in my day, when I went to high school, we actually only had five kingdoms, so <laughs> I guess that tells you how old I am. I never really thought about it before, but there are six kingdoms now. Bacteria and Archaea, the two prokaryotic kingdoms, were actually combined as one kingdom back then when I was in school called Monera. So even in that little gap since I was in high school, it's getting, getting progressively bigger, but I still think of it as a little gap since when I was in high school, uh, things have changed. So up until now, we have six kingdoms, uh, and we're going to walk through this video, walking through each of those kingdoms and discussing some of the unique characteristics within them. Uh, this is very important that you understand all of the differences between the kingdoms, and you can identify specific kingdoms based on the traits that are given to you. Now, I do want to warn you, there is no lecture quiz for this video. Uh, to get your credit for this video, you need to make sure you have a copy of the characteristics chart that goes with this video and have it in front of you right now. So while we go through this whole video, you're taking notes, writing things down. I'm going to check your notes. So you have to show me that completed chart uh, in order to receive credit for watching this video. So again, there is no lecture quiz. I passed out that worksheet for you. It says Six Kingdoms uh, Characteristics Chart. Make sure you have it in front of you and be ready to use it in your note taking. If you haven't gotten it out, then make sure you go get it right now, or if you need to, go onto the MyPISD site and print it out, and I'll wait here for you. Oh, okay, you got it? All right, good. All right, so here we go. We're going to go through all the characteristics of the six kingdoms, little by little, making sure you understand everything that falls into play. Now, you've, you've been doing some activities in class that hopefully have done a good job of preparing you for this point because there are going to be a lot of terms that we're going to use in relation to the kingdom. So to start, let's review some of those terms. Now, the kingdoms themselves are what you see here. There are six of them. We have archaea, bacteria, protista, fungi, plantae, and animalia. Now, like I said before, archaea and bacteria used to be clumped as one kingdom called Monera. Uh, that was actually the kingdom back when I was in school. Uh, since then, it's broken into two because they've identified that the organisms that are in archaea are actually significantly different than bacteria. Actually, even recently, just a few years ago, these two kingdoms were considered archaebacteria and eubacteria. And you'll, if you ever look into the book, the online textbook or the biology book that you might have checked out, it's still called archaebacteria and eubacteria because that book was written about 10 years ago. So even in this short time period, it's been changed to just being archaea and bacteria because the organisms in archaea are actually so different from bacteria that they don't even want the word bacteria connected to it. So significant changes there. The other four kingdoms have been the same for a little while. Protista, fungi, plantae, and animalia. And I predict if there is going to be any sort of a growth of kingdoms and an increased number of kingdoms, it'll probably happen in protista. And I'll explain why as we go through those kingdoms. But those are the six kingdoms, and each one of them are very important for you to understand characteristics between them. Now, the first thing we're going to see is the difference between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Now, if you were involved in the uh, 
the stations, the classification stations, I think it was station four, covered the, dif the differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes and asked you to make that Venn diagram. There are four key differences that I want you guys to pick up on. Difference number one has to do with whether or not they have a nucleus. Of the two, we have prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Which one has a nucleus? Good. So the eukaryotic cells have a nucleus, right? The prokaryotic cells then have no nucleus. So that's the major difference between the two. Um, one of the things on that activity was to come up with a, a, a unique way to remember the difference between prokaryote and eukaryote. For me, I think pro no, you do. Prokaryotes have no nucleus, eukaryotes do have a nucleus. That's probably the major difference between the two and probably the thing you'll get quizzed on or tested on the most. So make sure you know the difference between them. Besides the presence of nucleus, there are also three other characteristics that I want you to know. One is the presence of organelles, which is also found in eukaryotic cells. So eukaryotic cells have organelles, which are small um, components within a cell that each perform a specific task. And we're going to go through a lot of those organelles over the course of the year, particularly when we get into the second semester and what they all do, like mitochondria, chloroplast, endoplasmic reticulum, uh, Golgi apparatus, all of those different parts of the cell with inside, those are called organelles. That's something that's only found in eukaryotic cells. So again, that means prokaryotic cells do not have these fairly advanced structures, organelles. Sorry. Okay. All right, so we have eukaryotic cells that have a nucleus, that have organelles. Um, the, th the other characteristics have to do with size and complexity. So because uh, eukaryotic cells have a nucleus, because they have an organelles, they're pretty complex. So they have a lot going on because each of those components can perform different things. And again, because there's a lot going on inside, typically eukaryotic cells are significantly larger. And when I say larger, keep in mind we're still talking about cells here, but those cells can reach anywhere to about a, a millimeter in width, which you don't think is very long, but a millimeter is actually something that you can visually see. If you ever look at a metric ruler, like those basic rulers that, uh, that you guys see here at school, the centimeter side, all those little tick marks are millimeters. So between those two, one, one mark to another, that's a millimeter. So cells can actually be about that large, especially when we talk about uh, some of the kingdom protista. Okay? So the prokaryotic cells, in comparison then, are very simple. Because they're very small, they have no organelles, they have no nucleus, they're very straightforward, very basic, but they've lasted for a really long time here on Earth. And they're also significantly smaller. When I say smaller, I mean it can range anywhere to about 10 micrometers in length. Now a micrometer is 10 to the negative 6 meters. So there are a thousand micrometers in just one millimeter. So that same little mark that we talked about before, there are a thousand little micrometers within that. So that's significantly smaller. Prokaryotic cells are super, super small. Uh, a big thing to think about why you know, it's hard to just start thinking about why some of these things have what they, what they have. But in particularly talking about the nucleus, imagine going out and playing a football game, tackle football, without a helmet. Probably not the brightest idea, right? Why? You know, obviously you're going to be involved in a lot, of, uh, a lot of collisions and you want to make sure you protect your head. So if you're playing something like tackle football, it's probably a good idea to put a helmet on. Now, at the same time, if I go play golf and I wear a football helmet, what do you think people are going to think about me when I'm going around uh, swinging my club, right? I, there's obviously no reason for me to wear a helmet. Yeah, I guess the random golf ball can come hit me in the head, but the likelihood of me having to wear a helmet to protect myself is really low. So it's all about the environment that I'm in. A eukaryotic cell is super complex. There are a lot of organelles, which means there's a lot going on. So there's a lot of uh, components within a cell moving in and out um, that could definitely cause damage to the most important part of that cell, which is the genetic information. We'll get more into that later. But that DNA is critical for the cell. Any damage to that DNA means the cell's done. The cell dies immediately if any damage occurs to that DNA, just like you. If you have any significant damage to your brain, you're done. So if you're going out to play golf, yeah, there's not much activity. It's pretty straightforward, pretty simple game in terms of collision and physical contact. So there's no need for a helmet. But if I go out and play tackle football, I better make sure I have protection because I don't want to damage the most important part of my body, which in my case is the brain and cells case is the DNA. So one explanation 
theoretically of how the cells could have eventually developed a nucleus to become eukaryotic cells is they became too complex and the ones that didn't have that natural protection kept getting their DNA damaged and kept dying out. But the ones that developed this natural protective barrier around their DNA were able to survive a lot longer because now the DNA is protected inside and everything that can happen outside super complex won't cause any significant damage to that DNA itself. So that's one explanation of how a nucleus could have developed. But that's also one way to think about why eukaryotic cells need a nucleus. Because they're so complex, because they're so advanced, they have all these organelles taking different things in and out, they need protection around the most important part. There's a lot more physical activity happening in eukaryotic cells than there are in prokaryotic cells. So prokaryotic cells have survived a very, very long time without the need of a nucleus because the activity inside of that cell is very low. That's why they're considered significantly more simple. They're simple because there's less activity and therefore there's no need for that protective barrier around their genetic information. They've survived without it, whereas eukaryotic cells, because of their complexity, would not survive. So make sure you know the difference between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. We're going to get into the, uh, the kingdoms and talk about that as a major point between them. Basically, the two prokaryotes are the two Monarin kingdoms that I mentioned before, uh, archaea and bacteria. Eukaryotes are the remaining four kingdoms, protista, fungi, plantae, and animalia. And that's actually how I'm going to break up the chart that you're going to do. First, I'll talk about the prokaryotes, then we'll get into the eukaryotes. So don't, don't forget the difference between those two. Those are very important terms we'll be dealing with all year long. Uh, another discussion would be the type of nutrition or type of feeders they are. You should remember from the previous unit, autotrophs are able to make their own food. They're self-feeding, whereas heterotrophs are unable to make their own food. They are different feeders. They have to go out and get their food. Now, a little more detail than that that maybe wasn't discussed in the last unit is the type of each one we're referring to. So if I'm referring to something that's a photosynthetic autotroph, obviously that means they go through photosynthesis. So they use solar energy or energy from the sun in order to get their sugars produced. Basic photosynthesis, right? Uh, carbon dioxide plus water combines to make glucose and oxygen gas. That's the basic chemical reaction for photosynthesis. So photosynthetic autotrophs use solar energy to make their sugars, which is the vast majority of autotrophs on Earth. Most of the organisms that can make their own food use solar energy. The only exceptions to those rules are the ones that aren't in environments where there's any sun. So we're talking deep in the oceans, uh, where those hydrothermal vents are, magma and, and uh, lava shooting up from beneath the Earth's crust, where there's no sunlight whatsoever, but all of those chemicals being released out are a pretty significant energy source. So over time, organisms that don't have solar energy available use chemosynthesis. So chemosynthesis then uses chemical energy, chemicals like uh, sulfur and hydrogen, to produce their sugars. I'll write down here so you don't confuse them. To produce the sugars. So if you are um, an autotroph that is capable of producing sugars with absolutely no sunlight, that means you're chemosynthetic. And again, these environments are usually considered pretty extreme. So think about the kingdom that we talked about, organisms living in extreme environments. That's going to relate to these chemosynthetic autotrophs. So hopefully you already have a little familiarity with that with some of the stuff we did in class. All right, so those are our two types of autotrophs. Either they use energy from the sun or they use energy from chemicals like hydrogens and sulfurs coming up from hydrothermal vents. Um, heterotroph, like we said, gets their energy from somewhere else. Now there are two categories of heterotrophs based on how they break down their energy. Um, so for example, all heterotrophs have to get food from outside. If you are an organism that actually brings the food into the body first and then breaks it apart, that's called ingestion. So we ingest our food. I'm sure you've heard that word before. So ingestion means to bring food in and then break it down, right? Then digest. On the other side, absorption as you know, absorb means to bring in through pores, right, basically. So if you're an absorptive feeder, an absorptive heterotroph, that means you don't have a digestive system inside. So instead, you use your certain enzymes and chemicals that you put on the surface to actually break the food down before it ever enters your body. So that's what we call an absorptive heterotroph. So absorption means you digest first, and then you bring the food in. 
So digest first, then bring food in. So that's an absorptive heterotroph. We are not absorptive heterotroph. Uh, a good example of that would be uh, anything in the kingdom fungi, uh, like mushrooms and things like that, have enzymes on the outside surface that actually chemically break down the food as it's being brought in. Um, that's why, you know, there are certain mushrooms out there that are poisonous. Uh, some of them, they're actually so hallucinogenic. Those chemicals are so hallucinogenic, they're actually used as, as drugs because the outside enzymes have a very strong effect. They, they're there to kill off and chemically break down the food that can then be absorbed in and used right away. So absorptive heterotrophs digest their food outside first and then absorb it through the skin. Ingestive heterotrophs bring the food in, then digest it internally. And we are ingestive heterotrophs, and so is the entire kingdom animalia. So some things to remember. All right. Okay. Now, as we get into the actual chart, we're going to use a lot of these terms as well as a couple of the terms we used before. So I just want to break it down so that you know what to expect when we go through the, uh, the chart itself. I'm going to do some abbreviations here so that uh, we can move through pretty quickly and we kind of save some time. So of the two cell types, let's start here, this column. We said before there are two categories of cells, whether or not they have a nucleus and organelles and complexity and size. The ones that have no nucleus, remember, are the prokaryotic cells. The ones that have a nucleus are, so I'm going to use PRO for the prokaryotic and EU for the eukaryotic. Remember, you do, pro, no. You do have a nucleus, pro, do not have a nucleus. You, as in the animal, animalia, we all have nuclei, right? Because we're more complex, there's more need for that protective barrier around our DNA. When we talk about number of cells, what I mean by that is the whole organism can be either considered unicellular, uni means one, or multicellular. If you're unicellular, that means the entire body is made up of just one cell, which is true for a lot of organisms, especially uh, the prokaryotic and one specific kingdom of eukaryotic is almost all unicellular. Multicellular means the body is made up of more than one cell. What do you think we are? Good. Obviously, we are multicellular eukaryotes, which means our body is made up of multiple cells, which is probably for probably for the best because any damage to one cell, if I was a unicellular organism and my one cell got damaged, I'm dead. That's it. But with a multicellular organism, you can have damage to a cell and you still have multiple other cells that do the exact same thing. They can pretty much take over. And that's going to be very important for our bodies to be able to recover from things. And that's a big thing that we're going to get into with the immune system and microorganisms in the next unit. So unicellular means the whole body is just one cell. Multicellular means there are more than one cell within the organism. Okay? And then with that, we get into levels of organization. You guys did one of the stations in your, uh, six, sorry, in your classification stations. I believe it was station three, was going through the levels of organization. We started with the smallest basic unit of life, which was the cell. And I think I tried to walk around each group as we went to this. Uh, there are things smaller than a cell, but we in biology start there because that's considered the smallest thing that has all of the characteristics of life, which we'll get into in the second semester. Anything below a cell, like organelles, uh, and then within that you can even talk about atoms and protons, neutrons, electrons, um, pesars, quarks, all kinds of physics and stuff you can get into. All of those things may have matter, but they don't technically contain all the components of life. So we start at the cell, that's the smallest unit of life. So if I'm referring to a unicellular organism, this is the level of organization, that's it. It's unicellular, so the only level of organization is a cell. A tissue, by definition, has multiple cells. So if I'm unicellular, there's no way I'm getting to the tissue level, right? So cell is the, f is the first level of organization that we'll get into. Tissue is next. Uh, which is just a collection of cells that all perform the same function. Then we have an organ, which is um, uh, basically multiple combinations of tissues that perform the same function. Uh, an organ system would be next, which are multiple organs combined together for the same task. And then we get up to the organism, uh, which deals with basically the living thing. Now, I want to stress here, I don't want to say that organism only will go after system because technically you can be an organism and not have body systems. You could be unicellular. If you're just made of one cell, you could be an organism as well. So I don't want to put organism there at the end, but these are the levels of organization I want to work with. So cell is the first level of organization, which all things are made of at least one cell, all living things. Tissue is multiple cells, so we're already at the tissue point. We're talking about multicellular. 
And then within the multicellular group, beyond tissue, you can have developed organs or organ systems. So we're going to talk about which levels of organization each kingdom can reach uh, as one of the key distinctions between them. Okay, cell wall refers to the different components in the cell wall for each of the six kingdoms. Almost every cell depends on a cell wall to function, uh, to, to perform an important function. It's not about regulation of what goes in and out. That's the role of the cell membrane. The cell wall is for more of a structural support uh, and, and kind of a rigidity and strength that's given to the cells. Now, not all kingdoms have a cell wall, but if they do have a cell wall, that's one key distinction from one kingdom to the next is what that cell wall is made of. Okay, so if you hear any reference to something called peptidoglycan, that's a P by the way, P-E-P-T-I-D-O, G-L-Y-C-A-N. Peptidoglycan is a specific protein structure that's found in one very specific kingdom. Uh, you may hear a reference to uncommon lipids. A lipid is like a, f it, it is a fat. So if you hear a reference to uncommon lipids, that's particular to another type of kingdom. Um, the, another kingdom may you hear a reference to either pectin uh, or silica. Those are unique to a kingdom. So you're going to hear me reference to that. Uh, you may hear a specific reference to uh, chitin, C-H-I-T-I-N, very important for one kingdom. And then finally, you may hear cellulose. So for each one of these, they're going to play an important role in de um, designation of one specific kingdom. And you notice that there are actually only five of these terms discussed here, which tells you there is one kingdom that doesn't even have cell walls. And we'll get to that as well. Mode of nutrition refers to how they feed. Now remember, there are two different general categories. We have uh, heterotrophs and autotrophs. So within the autotrophs, remember there are photosynthetic autotrophs. So I'm going to write PA, referencing photosynthetic autotrophs. That means they get their energy, they can make their own energy, and they get it from solar energy from the sun. Then you have your chemosynthetic autotrophs, which are much less common. CA, those are the ones that can make their own food using chemical concentrations like sulfur and hydrogen. Then within the heterotrophs, there are two categories. You can be an ingestive heterotroph, IH, which is what we are, taking food in first, then breaking it down. Or you can, you can be an absorptive heterotroph, which is AH. That means they break the food down from the outside with enzymes, and then that those small particles can make it straight through and be immediately used as a food source. So uh, those are the four categories that we'll get into, and a lot of times we're going to talk about some kingdoms that can be both or have one or the other, uh, but that, those are the different modes of nutrition that I'm going to use and the little abbreviations that I'm going to use for it. And finally, there are three general types of uh, reproduction. Well, really, there are only two. There's uh, asexual and sexual. And I'm sure you guys will like my abbreviation for that, right? All right, so asexual is the opposite of sexual. Uh, you may think you know the definition or the difference between them, but really it all comes down to one thing. Asexual reproduction deals with just one parent. If you have one parent going through the reproductive process, that's asexual. So one cell basically splitting into two is asexual. If you have two parents combining information to make an offspring, that's sexual reproduction. So two separate parents contributing to the formation of one cell or one offspring, that's sexual reproduction. So don't, you know, make sure you know the difference between the two. Asexual starts with one and splits into two. Sexual starts with two and combines to form one. So we'll talk about that. And then finally, uh, within that, you may have, as, as uh, I'm going to talk about, some kingdoms actually have the ability of going through both processes, both asexual and sexual reproduction. So you may see me write both there. So make sure you know what that means. Finally, motility. You should have gotten this from one of your stations, the one with the Freyer model, station uh, five. Motility is the ability to move. Okay, so if something is able to move, I'm just going to say yes. That means motile, right? If it's non-motile, non that means it cannot move. It's sessile. It's stuck where it is. That means I'm going to write no because it's not able to move that way. All right, so those are all the ways that I'm going to break down uh, the actual kingdoms on the chart. So let's knock it out. Let's go straight through them. We're going to start by dealing with the prokaryotic kingdoms. So the prokaryotic kingdoms are the two ones that were originally in the kingdom Monera. So for cell type here, I'm definitely going to write pro. And this is where I want you guys to start filling this in. So both archaea and bacteria are considered prokaryotic. Another thing that's the same for both of them is that all prokaryotic cells are unicellular. 
These are the only two prokaryotic kingdoms. And every single organism in these two kingdoms are unicellular. That means their entire body is made up of just one cell. They can work together with other unicellular organisms, but each individual organism is just one cell. So that's a very important thing to know. Um, we're going to watch, uh, do some things under a microscope, and you're going to see the different shapes of those cells, how, what they can be, whether we talk about cocci, bacillus, or spirulum, but you'll get to that. But archaea and bacteria are both unicellular. For levels of organization, if they're both unicellular, what level can they reach? Right, they can only reach the cell level because... Obviously, each of them is only made of one cell, so you're not going to have any tissues because, by definition, that would involve more than one cell. So they're at the cell level. The cell wall is one distinction. So notice how everything's been exactly the same up to this point. If you hear me referring to peptidoglycan, peptidoglycan, that's bacteria. So bacteria have these unique protein structures called peptidoglycan in their cell walls. That's actually one way to stain bacteria. We get into gram staining and things like that. We'll talk about that later. It refers to the amount of peptidoglycan that's in that cell wall. But they all have some peptidoglycan. Uh, and if it's archaea, their cell wall is actually an extra layer of insulation, which makes sense if you think about the environments that they live in. So archaea live in extreme environments. Right? You may want to write that here off to the side. Archaea live in extreme environments. So what I mean by that is they live in areas where it's very, very hot, um, high concentration of salts, high gas concentrations, things that most organisms could never survive in. So it would make sense that they can survive in these environments because they have an extra layer of insulation, an extra layer of fat. And that's where we get into those lipids. So if you ever refer to uncommon lipids, types of lipids that you don't usually see in the cell wall, we're going to be referring to the kingdom Archaea because they live in these extreme environments. So if you hear about uncommon lipids or uncommon fats, an extra layer of insulation around the outside, that's to allow these Archaea to survive in such extreme environments. All cells have lipids in their cell membrane, which is just inside, but to have it in the cell wall is pretty unique, and that's something that's true for the kingdom Archaea. In, in terms of modes of nutrition, um, these organisms, depending on which one we're talking about, can actually feed uh, through both as autotrophs or heterotrophs, depending on the organism. I will say the archaea, if they're going to be autotrophs, are typically chemosynthetic autotrophs. And then they could also be heterotrophs, usually absorptive heterotrophs, which means their one cell can bring nutrients in. They don't have any sort of organ system inside to break it down because, again, they're just made of one cell. Bacteria can also be either autotrophs or heterotrophs. But in this case, if they're autotrophs, they're not chemosynthetic. They're photosynthetic. So they're the type of autotrophs you would typically see within any given ecosystem. Um, cyanobacteria is an important bacteria as a producer in a lot, of, uh, a lot of ecosystems. It's actually what was thought to be among the first producers of oxygen into the ecosystem to really start bringing in all of the different animals um, that, that were thought to have developed here on Earth millions of years ago. So bacteria play an important role in photosynthesis. There are a lot of producers that are photosynthetic autotrophs. Uh, but at the same time, they're also heterotrophs. And these, again, are absorptive heterotrophs. And these are the ones usually that are what give bacteria a bad rap. You guys probably, when you think of bacteria, you automatically think something negative. Well, that's these bacteria that can actually cause disease and cause injury. They're parasitic in their environment because they feed off of other uh, off of their host. And a lot of times animals are the host, including us. So we get, a, you know, bacteria get a bad rap because of the ones that are the heterotrophs. But there are photosynthetic autotrophs that are in the kingdom of bacteria, and there are also heterotrophs that may feed off of things, but they actually help us. They may feed off of something that in turn actually gives us an advantage. So it's not always a bad thing if we talk about bacteria in our bodies or on the surface of our bodies or anything like that. Or in terms of reproduction, one thing that's true about both of these kingdoms is that they are 100% asexual. They both reproduce by a process called binary fission, which again just means uh, one cell splitting to two. The, the word binary means two. Fission means to separate. Fusion means to combine. Fission is to separate. It's the opposite. So binary fission is one cell splitting into two, which is the basic asexual reproductive process that all prokaryotes go through. So that is one thing that's the same for both of them. And finally, motility. They are both typically considered motile because they both have the ability of movement within their environment. A lot of times it's a pretty fluid environment. 
so they can move around. Some, some species of bacteria in particular develop little tails called flagella or little tiny hairs on the outside called cilia that help them kind of move around to get where they need to go. So a lot of the, the kingdoms both are motile, which means they're capable of movement. Okay, so that's archaea and bacteria, the two prokaryotic kingdoms. Everything else is considered eukaryotic. So that means these two have no nucleus, they have no organelles, they're very simple, very small. They're very straightforward, very basic. They haven't had the need to develop a nucleus because the activity inside is pretty low. Okay? Now compare that to our eukaryotic kingdom. So all four of these, just like I mentioned, are eukaryotic. So I'm going to go ahead and write EU for all of these because every one of these, every cell has a nucleus and has organelles. It's significantly larger and more complex. So because it's more complex, they need to protect their brain, which in the cell's case is the DNA. They need to protect that DNA, so they've developed a nucleus around it to do so. Now, for number of cells, let's start with protista. The kingdom protista is almost all unicellular. So here's the thing. If you find an organism that's eukaryotic, which means it has a nucleus, but it's unicellular, there's a good chance it's going to fall into this kingdom. So this one is mostly unicellular. Okay, that means most of the kingdom protista is, are organisms that are entire body is just one cell. But that one cell, because it's eukaryotic, is a lot more advanced, a lot more going on inside. A lot of the organelles that give it more advanced function. To continue with the trend here, the kingdom fungi is the opposite of protista. There are some examples of unicellular fungi. There are. But the majority of the kingdom fungi is multicellular. So here, I'm going to say mostly multi. So that means the majority of the kingdom fungi is made of multiple cells, so we get past the cell level of organization. And then with the kingdom's plantain animalia, it's 100% multicellular. So both with plantae and animalia, we're dealing with fully multicellular organisms. And as you can imagine, in the evolutionary development, plantae and animalia are thought to be among the most recently developed um, kingdoms and all the species of organisms within them. All right, so for levels of organization, if we're talking about mostly unicellular organisms, that means the level of organization mostly is at the cell level because, again, the whole body is just one cell. For the fungi, now we're into the first levels of organization beyond the cell. In the case of fungi, if you ever cut into a mushroom, you don't see organs inside, right? You don't see this digestive system or anything like that. Instead, you just see a whole bunch of fibers, right? So those fibers represent massive amounts of tissue. So fungus is the first example of an organism that can go past the cell level of organization throughout the whole kingdom, with the exception of the few that are unicellular, but this one is mostly at the tissue level. I should probably stress that. Mostly tissue. Because again, you have the ones that are unicellular, like yeast is one thing you're going to be looking at in a microscope. Those are actually unicellular, so they'd only be at the cell level. Plantae are past the point where we're dealing with cells, we're past the point where we're even dealing with tissues. There are significant organ systems inside of a plant. You don't think of a heart or lung or uh, you know liver or anything like that when you look at a plant or you cut into a flower, but in the reality there are a lot of components within a plant that give it the ability of performing very uh, complicated functions. So we're going to get into that with plant homeostasis a couple of units from now, but the plant systems or the plants actually make it up to the body system level. So don't be surprised when we talk about organ systems and we refer to plants as part of them because they actually do have significant uh, complex components within the cell and within the whole plant to give it the ability of doing certain things. And finally, the kingdom animalia, again, is up at the system level, which means there are more complex capabilities within the organisms to do large, complex tasks. Okay, uh, Cell wall. We talked about peptidoglycan in, in, uh, in bacteria. We talked about uncommon lipids in archaea. Protista is going to be this kingdom where basically any if it's eukaryotic, but you can't distinctly say it's fungi, plantae, or animalia, then that means you pretty much can throw it into protista because protista has a lot of variety within it in terms of characteristics. Besides it being eukaryotic and mostly unicellular, there's a whole lot of variety. You have fungus-like protists. You have plant-like protists. And you have animal-like protists. So there's a lot of distinctions. This is why I think this kingdom is probably going to branch out 
if there is any more extensions of the kingdoms, it's probably going to happen here in Protista. So within the cell walls of Protista, you find a lot of different things. But if you ever hear a reference to either pectin, P-E-C-T-I-N, or silica, that's something that's specific to the kingdom Protista. So if I tell you, yes, it's eukaryotic, uh, you don't know how much else, else about it, but you know that it has pectin in its cell walls, none of the other kingdoms have pectin in the cell wall, so that must fall into the kingdom Protista. You may even hear cellulose. Cellulose is something we're going to get into with plantae. I know I'm kind of skipping ahead. But plantae, all of the plants have cellulose in their cell walls, which is just complex chains of, of carbohydrates. Um, that cellulose is something that you would think is only found in plants, but there are plant-like protists like algae that also have cellulose. So you may hear cellulose. If you hear that, don't automatically assume plantae. There are possibilities that could fall into protista too, but something like pectin and silica won't be anywhere else. So those are specific to that kingdom. The kingdom fungi has a unique structure called chitin in its cell walls, C-H-I-T-I-N. It's a structure that is found in other kingdoms, but not in a cell wall of other kingdoms. So we'll talk about animalia here in a second, but chitin in the cell walls is specific to the kingdom fungi. Don't um, deviate from that. If you ever hear chitin cell walls, automatically go to the kingdom fungi. Animalia is the only one of the six kingdoms with no cell wall, right? So that means they are only surrounded by a cell membrane. Now, there are organisms in the kingdom Animalia that have chitin, but that chitin is what actually makes up the exoskeleton, the outside hard shell of a lot of the arthropods, insects, and as well as crustaceans. So uh, like beetles and cockroaches and things like that have a thick outer shell that's made of chitin. It's made of the same stuff that's in the cell walls of fungi. Uh, and then the, exo the exoskeletons of crustaceans like lobsters and shrimp and crabs, those also are made of chitin. So it gives it that real strength that fungi depend on. It gives it that real strength that fungi depend on, on the outside. So if you hear chitin somewhere else later in the year, don't be surprised. But in the kingdom, talking about cell walls, it's only found in the kingdom fungi. Okay. For modes of nutrition, um, protista, again, because of their variety, some organisms are autotrophs, some organisms are heterotrophs, so you really have kind of every variety here with the exception of um, chemosynthetic autotrophs. So there are no chemosynthetic autotrophs. If you see chemosynthetic autotroph, you can pretty much immediately throw it into the kingdom Archaea, which is that prokaryotic kingdom before living in the extreme environments. Um, every other organism if we talk about autotrophs, they're usually going to be photosynthetic autotrophs. The next kingdom is the kingdom of fungi. Now, this is one of the things that is 100% true about the kingdom of fungi. One of the ways you can pretty much identify fungi from anything else, or at least you can eliminate something, is not being fungi. Uh, the 100% of the kingdom of fungi are what we consider absorptive heterotrophs, which means they get their energy by chemically dissolving the food on the outside with enzymes and then absorbing that food in. Absolutely none of the kingdom fungi are autotrophs. No fungi can make their own food. Remember, most fungi are decomposers. That means they are absorbing nutrients from dead things. So they're pulling those nutrients away from dead things, chemically breaking them down before they're brought into the body. So all of the kingdom fungi are what we consider absorptive heterotrophs, a key distinction there, that's 100%. The kingdom plantae is also 100% for its type of nutrition. You guys should know most plants, or all plants, when we talk about them in uh, the trophic levels of ecology unit, they're always that first trophic level, they're always our producers. So they're autotrophs. In particular, the entire kingdom plantae is what we consider photosynthetic autotrophs. So again, no chemosynthesis happening with plants. Plants all use solar energy, absorbing that energy to produce their sugars. So photosynthetic autotrophs are 100% true for the kingdom plantae. And then when we get into animalia, they're 100% the other type of heterotroph. These are our ingestive heterotrophs, which means they bring the food in and physically break the food down inside and chemically break the food down inside. And then they use it for their, their nutrient source. As compared to fungi, the absorptive heterotrophs that break the food down first and absorb it in. Okay? In terms of reproduction, I'll save you some time. All of these can go through both asexual and sexual reproduction. Here's what I mean by that. I, I don't mean that they typically get a choice or that it's either one or the other. Most of these organisms go through both depending on the scenario. So we as animals, I'll give you an example. So when you have a, a lung cell that only survives a certain period of time, if that cell were to die off without producing more, then you'd have 
problems. But that doesn't work that way. Our cells are naturally reproducing over and over again. That's called mitosis, and we're getting into that cell division in the second semester. But that process of one cell eventually producing two is asexual, and we do that. So just for our own survival and our own everyday functioning, we go through a lot of asexual reproduction. Now the other side, if I want to actually produce my own offspring, which is a different organism than myself, to do that we go through sexual reproduction, which means I as a male produce the sperm, the female produces the egg, and we combine the two together through sexual reproduction to actually make the offspring that will be another organism. So another difference, we do go through both. Motility is an important thing, particularly for the kingdoms fungi and plantae. Both of these kingdoms are non-motile. That means they're stuck where they are. Especially important for the kingdom fungi because they can't make their own food. So in order for a fungus to be functioning and, and to survive in their environment, they have to be, be grown or they have to grow off of another organism specifically in a place where they can feed off of other dead things. They have to be able to just naturally be in the right place at the right time or else they're not going to get their nutrients because they can't go get it. Now, most of the kingdom animalia, there are a couple of exceptions, but most of the kingdom animalia does have the ability of moving to get their food source. So we're heterotrophs that go get our food, so we are typically motile, right? Um, the kingdom protista, again, they have a lot of variety within them, but most of the kingdom is capable of movement. So yes, the kingdom protista are also motile, and you're hopefully going to see some protists move under the microscope when you look at paramecium uh, and things like that. They are actually capable of movement. Okay? So we've broken down all six kingdoms with these basic characteristics. Know the difference between them. Hopefully you got that chart filled out and you can show that to me tomorrow um, or whenever it's due so that you receive credit for it. Remember again, there is no quiz for this. So if you haven't taken notes, unfortunately go back and review it. Quickly copy down this information so that uh, you can receive credit for it. All right, sorry this video is a little long, but we need to cover all the details within the differences in the kingdoms. This is a very important part of the test that you're going to have, so please make sure you study it and you know it well. All right, guys, thanks a lot. Enjoy the rest of the week.